Hi everyone, I'm Cameron Lemon. I'm a PhD student at the Institute of Astronomy in Cambridge, uh, working with Richard McMahon and Matt Auger. And today I'm going to show you some work we've been doing with the Gaia data releases to discover the elusive gravitationally lensed quasars. And hopefully I'll explain why Gaia is the perfect machine for finding so many of these systems. So firstly, why do we want to know anything about lensed quasars and why do we want to know about more of them? So if you imagine a background source quasar almost perfectly aligned along the line of sight to the observer with a massive foreground galaxy, the bending of the light creates four images of these, this blue quasar or, occasion, or sometimes two images around the red lensing galaxy. So this allows you to probe the mass profile of the lensing galaxy. Uh, the magnification of this geometrical setup allows you to study the source structure of the quasar in, in detail and the extended host galaxy in the, lensed, in the quasar becomes lensed into an Einstein ring, which allows you to study these um, the quasar-host galaxy connections, which, without the lensing effect, would be very difficult to, to um, disambiguate between the, uh, between the light from the quasar and the host galaxy. You can also do some cosmology with lensed quasars. That's because the sources are variable, and so if you monitor each of the images of lens quasar, as has been done for our RxJ1131, A, B, C, and D here, they all vary exactly the same way because they're the same source. However, the light paths from source to observer are slightly different lengths, and this manifests itself in a time delay. This time delay depends on the actual geometry of the, of the lensing potential, but it also depends on the Hubble constant. And recently, measurements have been used on just three lensed quasars down to 4% precision on the Hubble constant. So all of these science cases are just limited at the moment by small number statistics. Really, only four lensed quasars have the data set to do this time delay cosmography. And with, with more lenses, we can start to shed light on current tensions in um, the Hubble constant. And so at the moment, we currently know of about 200 lens quasars. Before the first Gaia data release, we only knew of 128. So this is a quick history of lensed quasar discovery. The first uh, lensed quasar, the twin quasar, was discovered in 1979, a six-arc second separated um, double lensed quasar. And then some dedicated um, follow-up campaigns tried to identify lensed quasars in the radio and then in the optical using SDSS, in the SDSS quasar lens search. And these led to maybe only 10 lensed quasars a year. And since then, no other real, real uh, major searches have been, have been made. But with the advent of Gaia, we've really been able to increase this to 50 lensed quasars published in the last year, just thanks to Gaia, and we expect this to increase um, ever uh, uh, more increasingly over, over the next few years. So what do those 120 lens quasars look like from before Gaia? Many of them aren't very bright in the optical because they were the radio sources. So up here, you can see the twin quasar. You see two... Uh, blue quasar images separated by six arc seconds, and perhaps you can also see the lensing galaxy kind of manifesting itself as this orange guy up here. So we can ask what happened in Gaia DL1 with the detection of these lens quasars. And 89 of the 128 had detections in Gaia DL1. But if we're going to use Gaia to actually find new lens quasars, what we really want to know is when does it detect multiple images of lens quasars, where in the optical it might not necessarily be obvious that we're seeing multiple images of a lens quasar. And only 27 of these lens quasars had multiple detections in Gaia DL1. <coughs> we still used it to find lens quasars, which I'll show you later, but along came Gaia DL2, and this went up to about 79 lens quasars with multiple detections in Gaia DL2. This is a very promising way to detect um, gravitationally lens quasars if we're able to remove the contaminant systems that look like lens quasars, and the number of these is overwhelming. Um, but Gaia gives us a way to remove these systems. So the, ma the main contaminant are um, quasars projected near stars and also just star pairs with quasar colors. So on the left, I show two systems with remarkably similar um, configurations. If you were to just use the pixels, it would be essentially impossible to distinguish whether one is a lensed quasar or whether one is a contaminant system. But in fact, follow-up spectroscopy shows that the one in the bottom left here is a lensed quasar with a background source at 1.7, redshift of 1.7. In the top left, it's actually two, two stars, unfortunately, right around a projected galaxy. Fortunately, Gaia Data Release 2 gives us proper, proper motion information, and looking at the significance of the proper motion for a set of quasars and a set of stars, we see that in green for the quasars, 
are all very low proper motion significance as expected since they should be stationary on the sky. Whereas for the stars, there's a large um, tail towards high proper motions or significant detections of proper motions, I should say. Doing the same for the 321 detected lensed quasar images, we see that they follow the quasar distribution as expected. There are a couple of detections of high proper motion, and we expect this is probably because of the, the close, um, closely separated images of quadruply imaged lensed quasars, and Guy is perhaps misassigning um, the images to uh, differently, um, different previously detected images, leading to spurious detection of high proper motion. So this is particularly promising to remove systems that look like this, where the two detections lie up here. One other major contaminant in our searches is star-forming galaxies. So again, I'll show on the left here um, an example of a contaminant system, which is a star-forming galaxy, a redshift 0.4, and then a lensed quasar in a similar data set, um, which has four images and a lensing galaxy. And so the real battle here is that when these systems are blended in ground-based imaging data sets, how do we distinguish between them when they have such similar colors, especially in um, U-band excess and in Ys? One way that people found in the first data release was to use the astrometric excess noise, which very well separates um, known galaxies from uh, stars and quasars, and in the red here are uh, known lensed quasar images overlaid. So there are a couple with large astrometric excess noise, and these are again the ones in the compact systems, but in general it's a very useful um, parameter to remove, again, remove further contaminant systems. So if we're going to use uh, Gaia to do a search for lensed quasars, we have to have some way of Firstly, selecting um, quasar candidates. If we were just to search for all pairs, we'd still be overwhelmed by contaminants, given the fact that there are still so many stars um, with low proper motion significance. One perfect way to, to match the All-Sky Survey as Gaia is to use Y's colors. And so here I've overlaid uh, Gaia minus Y's 1 and I would say W1 minus W2 Y's colors for a spectroscopic sample of quasars on the right stars in the lower left, and galaxies in the top left. And you see it's a very effective way of selecting quasars. Unfortunately, the Y's PSF is six arc seconds full width half maximum in, Y's one and, in W1 and W2. And so if you take a contaminant system that's a QSO plus a star, the star contributes very little flux in the, at the near-infrared wavelengths. And so when it's blended together and catalogued, it really appears like a, len, like a, a quasar source still, as a lens quasar would. But we can actually use, um, use the Gaia positions to extract model photometry from, from Ys, if we know the PSF, which we do, um, to extract W1 and W2 for each of these components. Doing this using the unwise coad data sets from Langer L2014, which use the most up-to-date coadded um, uh, Ys1 and Ys2 um, images. Doing this for a set of lensed quasars, and extracting that Y's color for all components of these um, lens quasars, we see that they very nicely sit on the quasar locus, while a few of them are uh, situated towards the galaxy locus. And this is probably because of the flux from the lensing galaxy being attribu attributed when we do this, do this bit. If we go and look at a sample of 52 quasar plus star pairs that people have spectroscopically confirmed previously, because they thought they could be lens quasars, so these are previous search campaigns. We repeat the process. You can see down in the lower left, 21 of them, the stellar companion plotted in red is actually given no wise flux. And so this becomes a very efficient way of removing things that look that um, a quasar plus a nearby star, even though the wise images are very um, highly blurred. So using all of this, uh, all of these techniques, so the wise um, fitting photometry and the proper motions and the astrometric excess noise. We've recently discovered um, a new set of 100 um, lensed quasars, and this really has only been thanks to Gaia, Gaia's way of uh, removing the contaminant systems. We're also able to select lensed quasars based on just one detection using an astrometric and photometric offset technique to ground-based imaging. So if Gaia only detects one of the, let's say, four images, Gaia is really resolving out the flux from one of them and so it's giving you the flux of that one image and the position of that one image, whereas in a ground-based um, image of the system, it's giving you the flux of the entire system and the, and the position of the centroid. And so by looking for 
differences in these uh, positions and fluxes, we're able to select systems that are likely lens quasars based on just one detection. So I'll finish up with uh, one of the science cases that Gaia has, been made uh, that Gaia has made possible. So this is in the system PSJ0630-1201. So on the left, I showed the PanStars GRI image of the system. And if Gaia didn't tell us that there were three Gaia detections here, we would think this might just be a star-forming galaxy because it's so blended and it has similar colors to a quasar. However, since Gaia, from the first data release, told us there are three point sources here with low astrometric excess noise. And for, uh, looking at the VISTA data also showed there might be some um, extended component um, here, which could be consistent with another quasar image. Uh, we confirmed that it was indeed a lensed quasar at redshift 3.34. And adaptive optics, uh, NERC2 Im imaging are from Keck, resolved nicely the three images that Gaia were detecting, and also um, show that there's actually two more images. So up here in the top right and right in the middle here, these are both images of a quasar. And there are two lensing galaxy, <coughs> galaxies here and here. So this is quite remarkable that, that you can get five images of the quasar, and you're seeing, um, you're seeing essentially a highly magnified 55 times uh, view of this redshift 3.34 qua uh, quasar. Removing the PSFs and the lensing galaxies, you can actually show that there's this extended component which comes from the quasar host galaxy being uh, lensed into a part of an Einstein ring. And we can do inferences on the size of this uh, quasar host galaxy, and it comes out to about 350 parsecs. So it's quite, quite amazing that uh, Gaia has enabled this kind of science and this probe of the high redshift universe, <coughs> when really it was set out to, to be a mission for the local universe. Um, so I'll leave my conclusions um, up here. Um, I'll briefly say, for the future, we're really interested in using the Gaia light curves to find lens quasars. So if you look at two nearby point sources and you see the, them varying the same way, this is strong evidence that it's a lens quasar, since you'd expect that. So you'd expect the same source to vary the same way with a small offset in the time delay. We might, use to do, might be able to use uh, 2D reconstruction from the 1D um, line um, profiles to, look, to, to reconstruct the, uh, an image of the system and look for the lensing galaxy directly in the Gaia data. Of course, it'll, it'll bring more precise uh, and complete proper motion measurements. So something I didn't men mention is that when, the, when you have four images all detected by Gaia, it's not often that you actually get proper motion and color information for them. This is a crowding effect that's already been mentioned. And uh, based on a complete sample of mock lensed quasars across the whole sky, we expect that there are about 300 lens quasars that Gaia should be detecting all of the images of. Um, yet we only know about 150 of these, so there's still a lot of work to be done. Uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, the WISE, WISE is an all-sky survey, so we're going in and actually getting the WISE colors. So we're downloading the coads, and we're putting down point spread functions onto the unwise coads and extracting the colors ourselves. So they, we, we're able to get WISE colors for anything in, um, in Gaia or essentially anywhere on the sky. As long as you can give me a position, I can extract uh, a WISE color for you. Okay, so you don't believe there are any quasars missing from your original sample? which you then, you know, so, the starting point where you began to search for lenses. Yeah, so we, we're generally always searching in extragalactic low density sky, so we do a cut on the local density within a square degree. Um, and we expect Gaia is very complete, um, especially when looking at previous catalogs of known, lens, uh, of known quasars and lensed quasars. So it's very complete to the magnitudes we're interested in and finding the bright lensed quasars. <laughs> Well, you could just walk over. Yeah, I go. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I, I can walk over there. Um, reconstruction of 1D PSFs to look for lens galaxies. Uh, I mean, that, that, that requires access to the photon counts Gaia data. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is, would only come with the final date release. No, it won't oh? come with the oh. final date release. Okay. Um, you won't so release that's that what I'm wondering. One. Because it, it's a sort of activity that in one of the uh, coordination units is being undertaken. Uh, specifically concentrated in Bordeaux. Um, 
but I'm not quite sure how we can uh, export this kind of activity outside the data processing consortia because it requires release of a completely new uh, data stream. Mm -hmm. It's actually quite extensive. Okay. You won't be releasing all of the raw data? Uh, the raw data will probably be accessible in some way from yeah. through ESA, but not through normal uh, data archives. Okay, as long as they're accessible, we yeah, can... And interpretation of it may be uh, far from straightforward. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Thank you.